So thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, just to our panelists to introduce themselves for a couple of minutes each. Um, and uh, to start with, we have uh, Gael. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Esme, and thank you so much for inviting me to, to join the panel. It's lovely to actually sort of get to meet the Athena Art Foundation. Um, so yeah, so, so I'm a uh, film writer-director and an immersive creator, and um, I co-created with Quentin Darris uh, a virtual reality series called History of a Painting. Um, although we actually to date have um, two episodes, so it's um, not quite a series yet, but hopefully we'll have more. Um, but uh, the one on, on Artemisia Gentileschi, The Light in the Shadow, is our second instalment. Um, and, uh, and it tells a story of Artemisia Gentileschi, who was a uh, 17th century Baroque Italian artist, and she has an extraordinary life within the art history world, she's quite well known, but still within the wider world, she's still a bit of a mystery. So the whole point of, uh, of uh, these episodes is to tell the stories behind extraordinary art and artists and to make the link between their life and context and work and today's uh, context to engage further with young adult audiences. And I'm sure Quentin will have a lot more to say about that. Um, but I'll just quickly also talk about the fact that we obviously we co-created, but we did build a whole team around um, each episode so far. Um, we were supported by Creative XR, which is important to, to say. Uh, we also worked with producer Charlotte Mickelborg and composer Jasmine Kent Rodgman and audio producer Larissa Miola and worked with amazing um, uh, talent to narrate our episodes. And so this one is narrated by the one and only Keris Matthews, which was very, very cool for us uh, to work with her. All right. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for having us. And um, I'm, I'm Quentin Darras. I'm uh, I'm an animator and, and uh, creative director, and I'm also the co-creator with Gail of uh, History of a Painting. So Gail already said a lot. So um, I think I think I'll just complete by saying that the, the real mission of this uh, of this series is really to um, to make history of, history of art a lot more accessible because. Um, we come from different backgrounds, but we uh, we're both obsessed with history and images and and art in general. And uh, we felt like there was kind of kind of a massive gap between just being interested in art and actually learning about art. And we felt like there was room for maybe something else in between, uh, more approachable for people who don't have necessarily the the education or the time to uh, to really go through like through the entire process. And um, yeah, we wanted to 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 make something fun, something short, and something kind of um, on the essential and basics of history of art. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, we'll definitely be discussing this throughout. So um, yeah, and and Kath, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Yeah. So um, as Esme said, um, I'm the head of digital at the National Portrait Gallery, and um, a huge amount of what we do is thinking about how we can use technology in different forms to engage audiences um and uh back in uh i want to say 2021 um uh athena art foundation and megaverse um uh, uh creative uh studio um approached us uh with this proposition of actually bringing a portrait to life which really spoke to our um Sort of ambitions and testing how different uh, technology could be used to engage audiences with uh, with portraiture, particularly with portraiture, which uh, might be something that people could just walk past, not understand the rich story behind it. Mm. So um, I think if you want to play it, yeah. So this is the 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 end result um, of of living portraits. That James Belcher, such a fine young man. That's what they used to say about me. But it's between bloodied fists that it all began. Butcher's son from Bristol. In 1800, I took on London City. I became the greatest bare-knuckle fighter our country has ever seen. Jones, Bartholomew Gamble, they dance a fine dance. But on the day, I was Napoleon in the ring. 
Sure, I'm a bit battered and bruised, but I still drink with the lords. Look, they still want to paint me. Don't let these fine fabrics fool you. This here neckerchief is what they've branded me with. Well, it was 17 rounds on Finchley Common. Without that knockout blow to end the bout, well, there'd be no idea of me. Have I changed? Nah. I ain't forgotten those first fairground fights which brought me to be sat here. What's that saying? The higher you are, the harder you fall. These young kids coming up, they want to be just like Belcher. Who knows? Maybe I'm one fight away. Maybe someday, some bright young fighter from around my way might knock me off my perch. So, um, uh, to give a little bit more context to that before before we move on. Um, so, um, we worked together uh, really collaboratively to identify a portrait where we... Um, we thought actually they had quite an interesting backstory. I mean, this is a period when um, uh, it was a, a shift from aristocrats being in portraiture to sort of new celebrity and particularly um, sort of sporting uh, figures. Um, and so we all thought actually what a fascinating story of someone who uh, was uh, a butcher's son who came to be the uh, at the height of his um, of his boxing, you know, the most uh, celebrated boxer in England, um, but a portrait that you might walk past and not uh, and not look twice at, and how we could actually bring that information to life. Um, and I should say that the um, wonderful uh, Adam Kelman um, scripted that for us, um, and really, you know, that that really brought it to life. But Megaverse and National Youth Theatre did all the technology behind it, which um, if if Ben and John were here, they would talk you through it. But um, I like to describe it in a sort of like Andy Circus Gollum style um, capture suit. Um, uh, and I'm sure as we go through questions, um, we can talk a bit more about it. But um, uh, as the galleries closed, we've um, shared it online via our channels. So it hasn't yet been in the gallery itself. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. I mean, what we'll do is, is I just to say, so yeah, thank you so much for the introductions and for introducing those two projects, which are really important, I think, throughout this talk, because they use digital innovation in such different ways. Um, and it's also worth mentioning, I think, at this point, that another kind of, we're not, we may not we don't have anybody here today who's like currently necessarily really involved with this, but online exhibitions, so virtual exhibitions where you can go and um, walk around the exhibition on your uh, phone screen or on your computer screen is also another really interesting way that I think we can kind of possibly use as a point of comparison as we discuss these projects as well. So I was wondering if, if to get us started, um, if there are any types of digital innovation that you personally think work really, really well um, in your experiences? Yeah, um, well, I mean, Obviously, I'm going to say virtual reality because um, that's what we did. Um, because the we we actually we um we had a review in in the Guardian where the reviewer said that you know the 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 past is a is a distant country and virtual reality helps get us closer to that. And I really liked that um, because virtual reality does create a link. Um, it's it's. I think there's something about being in a space and sharing a space with a story where, where whether or not you have an active role to play in that story, you you do actually have some agency because you can move in that space. Um, mm -hmm. And so that really does create a link. And I think that's probably one of the most important things with history is feeling connected to it. Um, and beyond that, it's not just the tech, it's also how you actually approach the tech and how you approach the creation of that piece so to that end we um we created um a story that was informal very um sort of colloquial we really wanted to feel like the narrator and the viewer were two friends two very close friends who just had never met 
Um, mm -hmm. And we wanted to dismantle this idea that art history was really only for um, uh, art historians or historians um, and that it was a highbrow um, thing because it's not, it's something that does really involve everyone um, and should get most people excited to some degree. Um, and so tech does really help with that and it helps make it more accessible uh, ideologically then obviously not all tech is actually accessible um, so that's that's where exhibitions are really important and, and making sure that we do have um, the opportunity to to showcase these pieces not only in big cities but also um, further out um, and and that tech like VR headsets are, are easily accessible um, to those who don't own them at, at home, for example. Um, but beyond that, I think, you know, I'm, I've just recently started thinking about um, dome uh, immersive experiences uh, where a couple hundred people can be in the same space and still feel like they're immersed within a universe and haven't quite figured that one out yet. But I think that that's going to be quite an interesting um, format moving forward uh, in the immersive sector. There's so much more to say about this. Yeah. Really nice. um, yeah. I mean, Kath and Quentin, are you kind of how how what are your thoughts on on like virtual reality stuff um, with this? Quentin, you're probably quite uh, into it, I assume. <laughs> well, surprisingly, I'm I'm not completely sold to VR yet, um, mm -hmm. even though it's definitely my field of work at the moment. It's just because I feel like the, the <laughs> technology is a bit clunky and everything, but it's it, it has that weird effect that. The, the longer I stay away from VR, the less I believe in it. And as soon as I put a headset on, I just, I, I realize how fun, fantastic it is. So mm -hmm. it's um it's just to add a bit more to what Gail was saying. Um, I think what's very important is it adds, um, for when you when you try a, a VR piece, it, it's, uh, it's 10 to 15 minutes or however, however long the experience is of undistracted, attention because you can't look at your phone you can't think you can't really think about something else everything you are in this world and you, you you're just watching everything which is obviously very good to uh to be in the right mindset and also it's it's very great for learning and everything so yeah, yeah. Um, for that i think Absolutely. it's truly very massive so i've i've experienced some amazing vr and some less good vr where i spent the whole time with my hand up going i keep getting get my head stuck to the back of it and i can't move around the space um mm. in which case i sort of feel that and, and i we we did online exhibitions as well just throwing that out there during um in 2020 and some of the feedback we got with some of those where we tried to be too clever was actually sometimes the technology itself became a barrier where it was taking people so long to learn it or you know to navigate through something but actually we had made it harder for people to engage with the art but obviously if it's done well it can be fantastic i think looking at what you know what technology is is good to use i think it's worth sort of looking at it the other way in that you know what story are you trying to tell and what are you trying to get visitors or audiences to look at. Um, I think that's sort of a key thing because actually, um, I was sort of thinking about this before, like some of the examples I've seen that have really stayed with me of using technology, things like the um, Asher Burnapal exhibition at the British Museum, where I worked there for a number of years and I'd never noticed the details on these like stone sculptures until I went to the exhibition where they projected onto it literally small details and told the story alongside it it was like well that's genius um and actually thinking about how you can you know use technology to highlight those bits and i think both of the um examples we've been talking about this evening are you know very true to we want people to look at a particular portrait and feel like they've they come away with a different understanding of it or a, you know a different form of engagement with it that's really interesting. Yeah, I think that the the barrier, I mean, that's that's where I think collaborative projects really are so important because I think that everybody like with uh with the Jem Belcher Living Portraits project, I think you'll agree, Kath, that um, you know, each each unit kind of had a different priority. And I think then coming together, um, 
meant that so like our Athena Art Foundation is art historians so we were like really wanting it to be like as close to the painting as possible then Megaverse was like really like emphasizing the tech side and then that all of that blurring together of um like as a team I think really like helped to mitigate some of those like maybe letting the tech like take over as well um I don't know did you like Quentin and, and Gail did you find that that collaborative aspect in terms of like the technology kind of yeah, the tech and the creativity, did that kind of help having a big team of people with different, bringing different things to the table? Well, I mean, so we we kind of always had in mind that we didn't want to create something that was going to um, be innovative in terms of tech. We wanted to use tech that was already established. And so we were conscious that history of a painting was going to solidify the this existing tech. And Bizarrely, for a VR piece, um, the more the most important thing was that. Um, uh, oh, great! Our meeting's been upgraded. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So bizarrely, for VR, the most important thing for us was the narrative. We wanted people to be able to close their eyes and listen to the narrative and feel swept up in the story. Um, then we also wanted to make it very accessible. So the gamification of this, this episode is it's really very simple, um, not just because we wanted to make it accessible physically, but also because it's so dense narratively, we, we had to pick one basically uh, and not overload the viewer. Um, so we really, we really, we, we really built this on the, on the strengths that we already had, which were um, storytelling uh, both narratively auditively and visually um and then from there Quentin learned unity from scratch for our first episode um and uh yeah well, I don't know if you have anything to complete well that. yeah the, the thing is um from from the start this um we we Gerd and I we were a very small team I mean we had a composer and and, and a producer like she said and um obviously we had we had help but the court team was very, very small, and um, we knew we could not um, revolutionize VR just with the two of us, especially because I still didn't know how to make a, 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 a VR app. So um, we focused on what we know how to do. And the thing is, we obviously making an app like this is making tons and tons of choices. And the, when you know what you're going to do, it's actually very easy because we felt like, no, we're not going to make a video game. We don't have to we're not going to have that much interaction because actually we want to tell a story and the story and like the more you go to the video game side the less you can stay on the on the story side mm -hmm. and so we made we made those choices and uh, some of them were we and we had no choice and some of them were actually actual choices but overall I think it's it's been um it's been a lot of just uh conscious actions to 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 make this exactly what we wanted and make it fit the, the real mission of what we wanted to do. Mm. And that mission is really, I think, yeah, it's really grounded in, in trying to bring the art history to the front. I, I really like how your uh, the Artemisia project is HI, like history, but also story. I thought that was really good um, in the title of it. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think setting seems to be kind of coming up as well I think as like a general like I'm picking up from all of these things that um like trying to work within a setting is is also like really important in this because I think with the VR you're almost transporting people like into a completely different setting um a lot of a lot of what the Gem Belcher one is is like you know people can watch it anywhere that's like like you were saying just at the start Gael about like how do we make this as accessible as possible obviously with VR headsets are still hard to get and and I, I actually have never been in a VR headset which is crazy because I've worked with Megaverse the the digital studio that helped with the Gem Belcher project and they're all about VR and, and XR um, technologies so I still need that experience, but you know, I think that also shows like, unless you are in the space for VR, you won't necessarily have experienced it. Um, and 
yeah, I wonder maybe Kath, if you could talk a bit about um, just to start with um, about the setting of a gallery versus and, and Gael and Quentin after as well about setting of a gallery and the real paintings there versus the kind of yeah the augmented reality or the virtual reality. Um, yeah, I suppose obviously within the gallery space, if we actually have the opportunity to have the um, you know the the real artwork as it were on display, um, what we want to do is try and help visitors to engage with it and understand it and look at it as much as possible. So while we you know will introduce different interpretive tools some of which will be digital actually what we don't want is to start again building up too many barriers unless it's really enabling people to look closely at the portrait um so i think nicola you sort of flagged ar i think um some of uh the you know the best ar i've seen is actually where you know it's a um it's an incomplete portrait or there's uh something um that we know was painted underneath and it's thinking about actually how technology can help you see that additional layer you actually couldn't see otherwise and then get you to look really closely or something like the um i mean again i have quite a lot of very old references because i worked at the british museum for quite a long time but again we uh, we used ar quite well around the parthenon sculptures um because they because actually holding up a sort of phone or a tablet, you can then see the complete piece. So it's thinking about um, how you can use it to really um, add engagement to those pieces, as opposed to sort of, you know, uh, taking people away from it. We remember seeing one where we had, uh, it was an autopsy, a digital autopsy of a, of a mummy. And we saw that everyone was around this sort of digital table and no one was looking at the object. We were like, mm. oh, that's yeah. quite what we wanted. But, you know, great that people were fascinated, but it's all about how can we engage people with, with the art, with the mm. objects, yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because one of, when I first came across this summer, uh, the Artemisia um, project, um, I was really interested by the choice that the, the actual painting um, which was on display is part of Burley House, um, it, it, the collection at Burley House by Artemisia Gentileschi. That was actually in a separate room. Am I right, Gael and Quentin? So it was part of the exhibition, but kind of separate. It was um, it was actually um, Burley House's <laughs> idea to to put that painting up. That painting is usually either on tour or it's in the family's private area of the house so it's not actually usually viewable by the public at Burley House and then it just happened to be there at the same time as as the VR exhibition so they chose to exhibit it in the house. I'm sure lots of different reasons came into play um, but you know one of them would have certainly been um, let's exhibit it in in in, the set, in a setting that um, feels aesthetically more right uh, than the one that the VR um, mm -hmm. series was in. And um, and also, so again, referring back to the same reviewer from The Guardian, um, he mentioned something like uh, the VR is tastefully placed at a distance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if there was also this idea of, you know, not wanting to mix the two um whilst also acknowledging that of course they are about um engaging with art and showing art um but perhaps yeah perhaps VR or or immersive technologies or to have their own space and then people um at their own pace can then go and explore the painting itself or the artwork itself and I think that that probably helps to bridge the gap between um tech and I guess um older cultural visitors who tend to be the the predominant uh, visitors of, of cultural institutions and who might feel perhaps a little bit more resistant to, to technology. So I think there's just a lot of things at play really um, uh, in terms of exhibition um, and, uh, and, and, you know, sort of finding that balance between the two. Did you notice 
that people, it's hard to tell because people will look at a painting that's there. And so it's hard necessarily to tell how their engagement has shifted with it. Um, but could you see people, did, did you get a sense that people were more ready to look at this painting afterwards or before or? I don't know um, that I, I I don't know, but but we did um, for for both episodes we have you know done some some like feedback rounds uh, from from viewers, um, and generally what we have found out was people did feel more engaged uh, with the content because they felt like they were they they understood more um, mm. about the artist. Yeah. Um, and also because perhaps they could also explore it in a space that was theirs and theirs alone. Um, so in terms of like actually seeing that reaction, I, I don't know. But the feedback that we got afterwards was really quite telling in terms of how positive that impact was. Yeah, that's great. I guess it's I guess it's difficult really to tell, particularly if people are already in the space, whether they yeah, how they would have responded before, um, but really useful to do that in a feedback group. Um, yeah, and part of the, I probably will, yeah, definitely, I'm sure will help in future to kind of give these projects more of a boost. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, ask a few of the questions that are in the chat now, if that's all right. Um, the first one from Michaela, um, says in terms of dismantling the notion of art history as something detached how do you think that these types of innovations can be used by museums to shift the role into more of a forum facilitator of communication rather than just a temple so i guess correct me if i'm wrong michaela that you're kind of talking about this idea of us standing in front of a painting or a piece of art and feeling that we're just observing it um rather than um, yeah, that having that kind of back and forth engagement. Um, I guess we have touched it on uh, on it a bit, but yeah, if if um, one of you, or all I, of you, yeah, I can yeah. sort of just say a couple more bits of that. I think it's always difficult in um, uh, sort of you know museums, galleries, cultural sites because everyone is going for a slightly different reason, and so it's understanding actually how you know. Uh, how you can balance different people's sort of enjoyment and the fact that some people do want that more sort of reverential time alone with a piece of art. Um, but I'm certainly, you know, uh, seeing both online and in site um, and on site, you know, uh, an increasing range of uh, things available for people to be able to um, have that more, uh, have a bit more of an interaction. And to be sometimes a bit more you know, playful. I think one um, one quite nice example I saw last year, the year before, was at the National Gallery. It was um, the now I can't remember what it was. Oh, it was it the, Verone was. the virtual it, Veronese. No, was it, it no. was the the Magi. So mm. you look at the uh, uh, painting first of all, and it brought in these different sounds. So immediately. You can have a sort of binaural sound immediately. You were starting to go, oh, are there sheep in this picture? Which you know you'd never noticed before. I actually started to have those sort of looks, but actually, and and then you were able to look more closely, and you could see some, you could hear some of the conversations happening, and it really made you look more deeply. But I think if we did that to every single picture. Um, I think that would diminish from other people's sort of enjoyment. Yeah. Of it. But possibly it's actually helping to give people those skills i don't know of you know look closely you know there are details that you haven't mm -hmm. seen and it's how you know technology can help actually pull out those uh pull out those things or tell you something that you couldn't know otherwise yeah thank you yeah um i think kind of part of that in maybe in terms of thinking about uh learning in in these different contexts because every all of this is about learning about these paintings and about the art history right but um in such different ways um there's someone has asked um do you plan on getting this these types of innovation into schools um and if so how so that would that's again kind of touching on putting it into a different setting i guess 
Um, well, that's that's definitely something we'd, we'd be very happy to explore. Um, it's been part of um, what we wanted to do for a very long time. And um, I'd like to, to say just because it's happening tomorrow, but there is a testing session in, in, um, in the library um, tomorrow in Catford where they're going to test a few VR stuff, including our experience, uh, the first episode of our series. And I'd like to mention this because um, we had a meeting and I thought it was actually a bit random to test this in the library until they mentioned that actually before every, every, everyone had internet at home, this this was like uh, the pool where you could actually go and have a computer and access internet before it was uh, diversified to the to the grand public. And I think it's quite nice that now they're going to equip some libraries with, with VR headsets uh, so everyone can have can experiment and and so yes of course schools but basically every uh, every cultural center or pool or just uh, is it's, it's a, it's a good target for us because that's where people are going to come yeah for sure and also I guess where these kind of part of I think particularly with virtual reality uh, people they still got this um, excitement about it there's still a novelty to it at this stage um, which gets people there um, I think often younger people quite pretty excited by it um, but generally I think people want to experience a different type of technology and if you put them into spaces like a public library or a museum public spaces people will come in and then hopefully there are other you know I guess particularly in a museum hopefully they'll stay and uh, hang around and investigate the, the artworks but yeah I think um problem with schools possibly is that uh it's it's also so sadly so much about funding and trying to get get you know I can imagine the wealthier schools having VR headsets and um but I guess it being in a public place and then getting classes like a museum or a um library then getting class classes in on school trips or things like that would also maybe work um for that educational purpose I guess um just sorry just to bounce yeah. back on, on the previous question and on something that Catherine said at the very beginning mm -hmm. that I thought is very interesting is um um, our second episode is is on a painting of Artemisia Gentileschi, but she's not super famous still, and her, the painting in itself is also not very famous. And uh, the portrait is at a National Gallery, and it's one of those many, many paintings that you can just walk past, you look at it, and you don't really pay attention. But the thing is, because we did all those, those research, and obviously I, I hope people watched our episode, uh, when you know of a painting or an artist, uh, it all of a sudden you you want to you want to share that knowledge you want to feel like you know you because you have a special connection with a special painting mm -hmm. you want to share this and i feel like the more you actually make special connections with piece of art the the more people want to share this and they want to uh, to communicate with this yeah absolutely and it becomes a social thing as well then because you've all had separate experiences maybe in a vr headset um or you know even just yeah uh, with you know what we all have different interpretations and then you want to share it with people and that's a really beautiful thing I think um yeah I'm going to just uh go uh Guk says um really interesting to see gamification um and immersification of art history um especially like we're talking about as a tool for learning and education are there efforts to diversify the kind of art history represented especially when it comes to non-white art Did yeah you? yeah Gail I, I can um, participate in answering this one, um, but um, we kind of we drew up a wish list of artists that we wanted to show in 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 our virtual reality episodes, and we wanted to to show Jean Michel Basquiat, we wanted to show Frida Kahlo, for example, um, and then you know obviously this will depend on 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 um, future partners that that we work with um, because we want to be sure that we're we're uncovering artists who make sense um for those partners as well um but absolutely what we kind of learnt by doing this episode on artemisia was how interesting it is to explore the story of an artist who really was very impactful um who who was very well known at, in her time um but who actually is not that well known by the wider public and it made us think about how the canon has been created and how that can actually needs not just can but needs to also shift 
Mm -hmm. um, and so we definitely are very conscious about that in, in building um, the, the series and, and who we focus on. And I guess that kind of um, can sort of answer Rachel's questions. Sorry, I'm jumping No, no, in. no, go for it. <laughs> but, you know, seeing as that question is about, you know, how do we decide which paintings to transform into VR? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just the painting itself. It's also what can the story and the learnings behind that painting bring to our audience? Uh, and that is a big part of, of how we factor that in and how we make our decisions for, for this series. Yeah, thank you. Right, um, Kath, I think I think this question, uh, Gook's question about um, kind of choosing, well, yeah, you're right, Gail, it, it overlaps with Rachel's question, which is how do you decide which paintings to use um, in these projects? But I think with, um, with the Living Portraits project, um, Jem Belcher was is, is very much it's a it's a re, uh, research and development um, piece at the moment. So we really have been thinking a lot about which types of paintings we'd want to include, and um, I think there's quite a few portraits of people of color over the centuries, which on one hand I think really need to well they definitely need to be brought to the forefront of art history, seeing as they've been left out of it for so many centuries. Um, but there's also the question of, you know, the sensitivity um, with which that needs to be done. Um, Kath, I don't know, we've spoken about this quite a lot. Yeah, we've. I was just thinking about, so um, we're working on various sort of in gallery um, elements from uh, the gallery reopens. And one of the, um, pieces that we're doing is actually um, a poem that was uh, written as part of the Tides uh, Poetry Festival um, a few years ago, but it's a dialogue between um, the Duchess of Portsmouth and her unknown um, uh, female attendant, who um, is actually quite prominent in the picture, but uh, no one has any identification of who she is. And thinking about actually how how you can start to give a voice to someone without knowing anything about them mm. and how to actually start to you know make it very clear that this is a sort of this is a you know fictionalization to get people actually thinking about that second figure and why this girl is in there um and you know previously i think uh, the portrait had been uh, the girl had been referred to as a slave but actually we don't you know there's no there's no indication that she was. I mean, there's no history of it at all. So actually thinking about how we can bring that to life and something like a contemporary take on that through poetry is quite a nice way of just asking or just inviting the audience to sort of look. But I think we've, you know, uh, definitely in our long list of portraits would like to bring to life. Uh, there's a huge range. I think yeah. so. some people yeah, have too yeah. much. Some people have too much to say. Um, yeah, <laughs> we, would, we, yeah. Feel we would end True. up doing a sort of feature-length film. Yeah, um, but it's definitely something. You know, when we're looking, and I think again, as as I said, there's something about the collaboration because we all look at portraits in a different way. Mm. So um, you know, Megaverse looking at it in terms of you know got quite a clean background behind. We can bring them out. They've got good features, ideally, sort of face <laughs> on and things like yeah. that. And they're looking at it very sort of technically. Um, and then you know, uh, Athena Art Foundation might be looking at it really from a um, art history background, and we're looking at it from a you know maybe a portrait that we know that audiences aren't as engaged with as others that we want to try and bring to the fore and tell their story. So I think in terms of how you, you know, you choose these portraits it, and, and sometimes you choose a portrait and then go, oh no, it's owned by a private owner who won't let you use it, which is sadly the reality of things. But, um, you know, there are so many different things that sort of add into it and, you know, We'd love to do all of them, really, but yeah. Yeah, I think what's really interesting, which I think's kind of come out of this or has been brought to the forefront in this discussion, is the idea of like a fictionalizing things and and trying to you know trying to stay close to the history as much as possible. But I think that once you get this digital innovation, also 
really involved in a project you start to see where our interventions come into it much more clearly which I think is actually a really useful exercise because it starts to bring up questions of you know subjectivity of what are we projecting onto this painting and this artist um which we've been doing the art history is is has always been that it's always been an interpretation but the digital part of it starts to really highlight that and I think when it's done well that's that's the magic of it is you can invite everybody to come into it and give their own interpretation um, and say look this is our interpretation so do with it what you want <laughs> um, in a way and I think yeah particularly when like you're talking about yeah an anonymous sitter in a painting and we know nothing about them if we went in saying, oh, this is um, our, this is the fact of, you know, it, it's just never going to work. And I think, um, I don't know what, what people watching are thinking about this, but I, I really like it when there's, there's a chance for me to, there are questions that are posed about an artwork, basically. I think people find that maybe easier to engage with than, you know, than a, an essay that's like, here's the information and that's it. Um, yeah, um, i just seen here, Michaela's asked, um, is, is a shift of focus from the art itself, um, is there a shift of focus from the art itself into more of a narration-based approach, which is quite interesting as well, because it's coming in with, I guess, again, it depends on, um, well, we all have our different things that we'd like about these things I'm saying oh I really like having all of the space to interpret but maybe also a narration um is a good way of doing it so Gael you said about your narration was quite informal in the Artemisia one. yeah um it sort of stemmed from from the idea that we had um, with Quentin of making something accessible and engaging and in French, there's this word vulgarization, which is um, making making things more accessible, but not not simplifying them. Um, and so we felt that creating a narrative went in that direction, essentially. Um, and in our experiences, we do focus on the technique, but we also focus on the artist's biography wherever whenever something is known about that artist. We include it. We don't. We don't make anything up, um, and and we felt that's important. It's not essential, obviously, to understanding or appreciating a work of art. But in a way, it having the bare minimum of information does empower people to then feel like they can uh, understand a work of art or like they can have an opinion. And it's it's almost giving permission uh, to someone. Not that we're in that position, but. When I studied art history, um, I was often confronted with the, the the same comment, which was, oh, well, I don't feel like I need a degree to have an opinion about art. And of course, you don't. Um, but holding some key information about an artwork and an artist does really help in understanding why on earth this is on a wall and not something else, for example, uh, and why it matters and why it is that we still care about this work of art. Um, and so that's sort of what we wanted to put forward yeah that's amazing and so important and I think I see I wish I could see it and I want to come and see it wherever I can um but I think it sounds like you've really merged that with the Artemisia project um and the series you've really merged that you know there there are facts that we need to know about this and about this artist but also his his space for you to kind of live it and think about it. Um, yeah, I don't know if Kath and Quentin, you have things to I, say? Yeah. I would sort of just, yeah, sort of just kind of add to that really, that I don't, <clears throat> I think, you know, using narrative is just, it, it's sort of one way of helping people to look more closely at the artwork. They're definitely not, you know, discrete things. Um, and I think, you know, Certainly with um, Jem Boucher, we'd be more focused probably on his story, but in other areas, definitely, you know, we're looking at actually uh, how to 
get people to you know, look again to understand actually relationship between artist and sitter to think about you know why people are being painted but also you know to look at the techniques i think you know at the heart of it all it's engaging people with the art i think it's those different techniques and those different tools for different reasons yeah definitely and i think that in all of this is the importance of diversity in in all meanings um because yeah like with you know i think it's really been obvious how these two projects and and various different types of technology including the dome which sounds very interesting um that you suggested gael about i think you know it's always it's going to have different effects isn't it the different uh, on on these experiences and that's really exciting because then the art itself is experienced differently and thought about differently. Um, I think we're going to probably wrap up um, if that sounds good, but I just want to read one last comment um, just about um, from Gook saying, I think often it's people of color who do not have the habit of engaging with art in general. This could be really transformative for marginalized groups to have their history, fictional or not, reflected in museums and in a fun and not traditional way. And I really think that that's spot on. Um, and yeah, I think this is feeling like it's kind of the start of, of this digital, um, as we're saying, innovation. And I guess we're saying that now because we are, it is kind of everything that we're doing at this point is um, kind of relatively new or novel. Um, and yeah. Um, so yeah, and Kath, you've done a dome before. Cool. I really, I'm going to look up this dome. What is it called, Gael, the dome? The one we used was Igloo, um, but I think yeah. there were a few of them, but it, it means that you can have it sort of 360 around you and um, uh, sort of uh, 360 sound as well. So you, you're literally walking around looking within, I mean, we did it where we took Hampton Court on tour so you were technically within different rooms of Hampton Court and you were looking around and seeing different things but yeah right cool. really nice. yeah so it's amazing these things how they pop up and then yeah do it so differently um cool well um I just want to say before we go uh hold on that if anybody would like to make a donation to Athena um to help us put on other events that would be great we're a not-for-profit organization so um i've just put the link in there and also just to our website if you want to learn more about what we're doing um and yeah it's been such a pleasure to talk with you today um and thank you to everybody who asked questions and joined us today um and we will be um continuing this conversation i'm sure in different ways um online um and yeah hopefully we'll be in touch and can't wait to see kind of the new next projects and new ways of using this technology so thank you